Hey everybody, welcome to uh, the Basu and Gunai Notebook. Uh, this is a special edition today, Arpin. Yeah, yeah, a little, it's not really an emergency pod because we're supposed to record on Mondays anyway, but uh, yeah. it is a game day. And so uh, Ken Hughes just spoke to the media for roughly 20, 25 minutes. Um, frankly, didn't say a whole lot, but we thought we would have a quick reaction pod to what he did have to say uh, with the trade deadline coming up uh, in a little over six weeks. Um, did address some things, so let's... Uh, Let's get to it. What was your what were your overall impressions of what he had to say? I felt I, I'm starting to think that the more and that's perfectly human, but I think that the more people there are at a press conference, the less Kent Hughes is going to say. So if you're alone with him, or there's three, four reporters, uh, he's going to be a lot more talkative uh, than he was in a room f- packed of reporters. Like there was a lot of us. Uh, this morning, some uh, media outlets had four representatives. Uh, so it was crowded, and he remained extremely prudent, uh, maybe unnecessarily defensive. I don't think that people were out there all guns blazing, ready to uh, dissect the fact that his team is underperforming or whatnot. I think that it, it, it was all cool, but, you know, he remained, he defended the his the first half of the season. Um, I, you know, among other things, uh, obviously he, he brought up injuries, uh, Kirby Doc not being able to evaluate uh, his progression. And there's a non-said factor in that, that uh, without Kirby Doc not being there, it's got an effect on other people, uh, other players too. Uh, and he said that the fact that the team doesn't have uh, a lot of depth uh, makes it so that injuries will hurt the Canadians more than it would affect a team that's got more depth. And it's tricky. Be- it's funny because a number of times we spoke about, you know, strong link, weak link, whatnot. And yeah. when you don't have a strong link, when you don't have like your superstars up front, at least you can fall back and, and rely on your depth. But the Canadians are in a strange situation where they're still seeking for an offensive dynamo for, for high end talent. Mm. But at this present moment, they don't have the depth that would support the success of a weak link team. No. They don't, and and that's you know pretty obvious when you see like Mitchell Stevens centering the fourth line. You see, you know, Joshua Law had to get called up. I think in the grand scheme, of the, I think I do think the Canadians want to give guys like Joshua Law a taste here and there. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some point they gave Mayu a game or two mm-hmm. just to get a taste. Um, I saw a lot of reaction. You know, I was still in Switzerland when Joshua Law got called. And I saw a lot of people were excited, but I saw a lot of reaction of like it's too early. This is a mistake. This and that. Like. Not the end of the world, you know. He just came up and played a, a game. Like it's not like yeah. they're calling him up for the long term. I don't think that's the plan at all. Um, but but it's a bit of a deviation to the plan, though. I don't think that originally they thought, "Oh, we're going to give games to Joshua." Hua. I think the original plan was, y- you know, let's let's wait and see, I mean, and if we can I wait can be, a year, I could be proven wrong. I could be proven wrong. But if he, I mean, if he stays here for a long time, then I would be wrong. Yeah. But and and you know what? If he if he if he merits it with his play, then then good for him. You know, yeah. if he forces them to keep him here. But I think I don't think the plan is for him to stay in Montreal for a very long time. So we'll see. But anyhow, it, it just it goes to the overall lack of depth in the organization. That even had the plan been for Joshua Watt, which I think it is more or less that that maybe this will be his his cup of tea. Maybe someone else will get a chance. Maybe Farrell at some point when he gets healthy. You know, Heineman yeah. was called. Heineman was called up and didn't really get much of a shot. But still, it's. These are the types of guys that I think they would like to get a little taste. And I think that was part of the plan. Yeah. Legitimately, but maybe a bit later in the season than now. Um, I'll just, just to continue on that quickly before we, we switch to another aspect. But when, when Gorton and Hughes took over, I think there was an idea that they would do a rotation, especially on defense. You know, they yeah. would call up guys, send them down, and they would be like sort of a revolving door. Uh, Injuries since last season have not enabled them to do so mm. uh, the way that they wanted. Uh, obviously, it started off with a bang last season with Gooley, Harris, and Jackai making the team all at once on opening night. Um, but maybe it's 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 going back at least up front a That's, little bit to that spirit. This you know? is my this is the point I'm trying to make. Is that this is something they've always believed in, like yeah. just having guys, not having guys just buried in Laval. 
that if you if you warrant it, and for a long time, Joshua Hua did not warrant it. He he went through a dry spell after coming out of the gates really hot. So then when when you're deserving of it, to reward that with a little stint, which is why which is why it's it's my impression without actually having any inside information on it, I wouldn't be surprised if Mayu got a little taste just because of the improvement in his game, especially since Jack High went down. Um, you know, if circumstances warrant him coming up and getting a game or two, then I, it wouldn't surprise me, you know, depending on injuries, obviously. But, over- yeah, but Baron doesn't need waivers to go down, and he's yeah, playing yeah. the right side. You could switch them yeah. for a week or two, and it'd be fine. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, but generally, you know, the overall, my overall sentiment, like, you know, you were right to say that he's less talkative in a crowded room, which is normal. I think any of us would be less talkative in a crowded room. But as you, as you, re- as you go towards these pressure points in the season, trade deadline, the draft being two of them, basically, um, Ken Hughes does a lot of public messaging, too, in these situations. So when he's asked about the goalie situation, and he talks, and he talks, and he talks, and he finishes it by saying, I can't, can, I can't give you a 100% guarantee that I'll trade any of them. Yeah. You know, that's public messaging. Even if, even if he said it in French, he knows it's going to get out there. Um, Sean Monaghan, do you think you might offer him a contract between now and March 8th? Anything is possible. I know that doesn't answer your question, but that's the reality. That's the truth. Maybe it is the truth. Or maybe it's just people telling, you know, maybe it's just him telling other GMs, like, listen, if you don't step up for this guy, I might just resign him. Yeah. He did that with Jeff Petrie. I don't have to trade this guy. Why would I have to trade this guy? What did he trade him twice? (laughs) (laughs) It's like, so... I think a lot of things have to be taken with a certain grain of salt with Kent. And I think he's, he's a little, he's, he's, he's media savvy in that sense and that there's certain messages he likes to get out there so that other, and he knows other GMs are reading this stuff. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. Like I have every expectation that Sean Monahan will be traded between now and March 8th. Um, it was interesting to hear Kent basically confirm that they, you know Darren Dreger originally reported that when when Sean Monahan re-signed with the Canadians for effectively two million dollars it was it was 1.85 plus a tiny plus bonus, bonus a games played bonus um, that at that time the agreement was okay we'll sign for one year and we will do everything in our power to get you to uh, either a competitive contending environment or a team of your choosing um, for the deadline. And so just wanted to get confirmation of that. And Ken Hughes didn't deny that. He said, yeah, generally speaking, he didn't, he seemed to suggest that there wasn't anything like firm. It wasn't written into any contract or anything, but there seemed to be a gentleman's agreement of some sort that if you sign with us, we'll give you an opportunity to play. We'll put you, we'll give you good minutes. You'll play on our power play. You'll do all these things, which is what he's done, um, which will give you a window to, further your career and, and get traded. So um, that surprised me in a certain sense, just because, you know, I was always under the impression that Sean Monaghan really wanted to make it work here. Yeah. And maybe he does, you know, but it's to have that be the sort of the pretext for his signing here, um, you know, makes, makes it quite clear that that's actually not the case, that, that he was, and, and frankly, that's a smart way of looking at it. If I were him, that's what I would want. I would say, yeah, okay, I'll come play for you for this small amount of money, relatively, you know, not, not for us, but for them. Um, if you, A, give me these, these opportunities to play in these situations and show my value and, and then get me to a team where I can play in the playoffs, show my value even more, and get that one final, probably final contract, big contract of his career as as a result of that. So now that that's on the table and, you know, Ken Hughes finished that answer by saying, no, that hasn't changed. That whole scenario, while it's nothing promised necessarily, but that general gentleman's agreement has not changed. So basically he described the gentleman's agreement as, as being, you know, you'll get a chance to play and then let's see what happens between now and March 8th. And that's status quo. It wouldn't be surprising that, you know, uh, John Klingberg, when he signed with the Anaheim Ducks last year, had a similar yeah. agreement right. where I start the season with you guys. You give me the opportunity to showcase what I can do. I prove myself. You give me the, the opportunity the to show that I suck. Yeah, in this case, that's how it turned out. <laughs> yeah. but Sorry, John. But <laughs> thankfully for, for Monaghan, it hasn't been the same. Yeah. Um, 
So, because he had, I think, an interesting opportunity to establish himself or reestablish himself as a top six forward, and that that pr provides some value both to the next chapter of his career, but also to the Montreal Canadiens if mm. they were to uh, uh, be able to sign him uh, to trade him at the trade deadline. We discussed his situation before, but I don't, I don't necessarily see the the upside, especially if it's, it means either a lot of money or significant term to bring him back in Montreal. It'd be great to have him next year in that same cushion role that he's been having last year and this year when he was healthy. But if he if he looks, I mean, if I'm Sean Monahan, I'm looking for three, four years at least. Yeah, you know, of course. a significant contract because it, it might be his last, depending on his health or whatnot. But it's going to be probably the the last significant contract of his career. If I'm the Montreal Canadiens, I I would find it a very risky play to turn to a guy like that. A because you already have Christian Dvorak who would be competing for third line center duty. You have Suzuki and Doc that are your top two centers. And you still know that if you want to be a very good team, you need another high-end uh, forward to improve that top six group, which means maybe that Doc could be moved back to the wing. So in any case, no matter where you put it, the only place that Monaghan makes sense is if they don't really upgrade on their top six and he ends up being a, a, a winger on one of those top two lines. So it might work for a year, but not over three, four years. No. And that's, you know, I understand why there are some people who feel Sean Monaghan is worth keeping around and why Ken Hughes <laughs> gave that answer to that question. Or, you know, I think it was Francois Gagnon who asked, is it possible? And he said, anything's possible because, you know, they really appreciate what Sean Monaghan does. Uh, they really appreciate him around the room, him around their young players, But the reality is that Sean Monaghan, you know, you have a finite amount of time to play in the NHL and make the money that you make. And, and when, when people cry about athletes and how much money they make, you know, I always say my answer is always there are very few careers that you start preparing for at the age of four where you're out. You're, the, your best case scenario basically is that you will play until you're 36. <laughs> like yeah. it's like, you know, like that's really the best you could hope for unless you're a really exceptional guy um you're out of the game by 35 36 so he's five six years away from that you know he's 29 he's he's this will be the last his last shot at making a significant amount of money he's already made a significant amount of money but you know these guys and plus he's a competitor and wants to play so and he wants know. to win and, and it's, not, it's win. not necessarily montreal is so, going to provide him well that. no that's that he's <laughs> definitely not and that's the thing is that keeping him around and signing him to another contract has benefits but it doesn't have a lot of benefits for Sean Monaghan, and it could, I, it, I could easily see a scenario where two or three years from now we're talking about Sean Monaghan blocking some young player who's trying to get a spot in the lineup, and so for some reason the coach keeps putting Monaghan out there. It's, it's, it just reeks of that scenario. So the other thing being, the other thing I find interesting, and that's kind of why, you know, Ken Hughes sort of playing coy, like, oh, I'm, maybe I'll offer him a contract, is just the, the value that he's going to be able to extract here. And then the interesting thing was the situation last year how much scar tissue is left from that you know Joel Edmondson and Sean Monaghan Ken Hughes managing these injuries and, and having teams calling the Canadians being like what's going on with this guy what's going on with that guy are they going to be healthy I think there was interest in both those guys had they been able to prove that they'd come back and play and Edmondson just didn't have enough runway to get it done um You know, once a game trade to Washington gets injured right after, <laughs> right off the bat. I know, I know. So, so you know, it, it's <laughs> what is the what is the market value of someone like Sean Monahan? I think he's proven, you know, he's been nicked up this year, but he's played through it. Has been pretty consistent, not from a production standpoint, but generally speaking, from a performance standpoint, um, has shown that he's able to that he's able to perform a veteran role, like a role that a winning team would want to have, like sort of as a depth center or depth forward. Um, what is your, what is the minimum you need if you're Ken Hughes to move him? The minimum you need? Yeah. The maximum everyone kind of sees, knows is the first round pick. I mean, that's the, that's the, the ceiling and that's the dream. Yeah. You know, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. So what's the, 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 the floor would be in my mind, The floor uh, is a third-round pick and a B prospect. 
That's the floor. Okay. You want more than that. I think that yeah. I don't think that the Canadians can get a first round pick out of my out of my hand this year. Uh, the way that he started the season last year, had he stayed healthy, yes. This year yeah. he started the season well, but the dip is not is not affected by injuries. It's just him being going through a lull, and that lull affects his value in in a way that you know that, that is not necessarily related to injuries. Yeah. So. I think a second round pick would be good. Uh, I'm not sure that a team would give a significant prospect for, for him. But if it's not a second round pick, then a third and, you know, and some something. guys that you can, some sort some of guy, cross, some <laughs> guy, some guy that, you know, that a you can work some with. Guy. Yeah. Some guy that you can work with, you know. Uh, probably yeah. not quite in the Emil Hanneman range. Like, probably, you're probably, you could probably expect someone a little less. Yeah, but you NHL know NHL interesting kind of, you know, it's like more than Tice Milanic, I hope. More than Tice Milanic, yeah. I mean who can barely crack the lineup in Trois Rivières. Yeah. So. <laughs> well yeah, he's had a anyhow. I mean, he's had a rough go. Well, it's yeah. just a peculiar go, I would call it. But anyhow, yeah, so I think the only path, because I don't think Jake Allen's gonna fetch anything better than a fourth round pick. And frankly, like the the you know, him talking about maybe we won't trade any of the goalies. Um I mean, we should talk about that because, you know, I think he's another target here and he's going to play tonight. So maybe by the time you're listening to this, he, he will have already played. Um, you know, we've discussed it already. You know, it's Jake Allen, not significant an upgrade for any of these teams needing goaltending. Uh, the complicating factor with him being the second year on his deal, the $3.85 million cap hit. Um, so to what extent... You know, and, and, and Ken Hughes not wanting to see this as a salary dump. They're not trying to dump Jake Allen. They're trying, no. to, they're trying to cash in some value out of Jake Allen. So he's not going to be like, I'll take a seventh round pick as long as you take this contract off my hands. That's not how he's seeing it. So, But that contract it affects Jake Allen's value. So him kind of playing his cards is like, yeah, maybe I'll keep all three all season. Who knows? Oh, this is, again, a Ken Hughes more... you know? No, I know, but... <laughs> You know, uh, edging his bet in in every answer is very much reminding me of, of Marc Bergevin when he used to say, I'm, I'm never done trying to improve my team. Those are, are, you know, blanket answers. It's normal that you would answer that. It's right But out I, of the textbook. For sure. It's a playbook. The GM. Well, you don't playbook. want to shut any door by commit, over committing by or over promising to the media or to the public. So that's fine that he does that. And I think that there's a bigger chance out. That's just my opinion on that. But I think that there's a better chance of Allen finishing the season in Montreal than Monaghan resigning before the deadline. I think that Allen could, yeah. they could choose to keep him and try to move him in the summer. But I think that one way to increase his value would be to use the fact that they've got a lot of money that they can get in for a bad contract in return. If a team is trying to make like a, a slight improvement in goal, then they consider that maybe that not, Jake Allen is no savior, but at least he'd be better than one of the guys that they've got there. Uh, like Samsonov's contract. For example. Yeah, yeah as yeah, an example. Yeah. For example, you take, or even could be a guy from, from at another position, but you mm -hmm. raise, instead of just considering Allen's value by himself, You look at how getting a bad contract back could increase that value, and it's, it, it would make a bigger, a bigger deal with more components. But I think that's a, there's a way there to be creative because that's that's a key that the Canadians have. They got a ton of cap space for for the remainder of season with all the LTIR room. Well, that's got. the the issue there. I agree with you, but the issue there is, are, are you willing to to spill that over into next season? Like, are you willing to take no, on a contract that be. goes past this season into next season? Well, I, I, that's that's what makes it tricky because a yeah. lot of the teams who need goalies have contracts that they would like to move that go past this. You know, I'm thinking of Jack Campbell as an, you know, just as an example in Edmonton. I mean, that's a Vitek that's a non-starter. You take Vanacek, same deal. It's non-starter. Like so, trading Jake Allen is extremely complicated. So yeah, I mean, I think when Kenny says when you take everything into account, all those things that. It's not a salary dump from the Canadians' point of view. It's um, they value 
what Jake Allen brings to their team, especially off the ice. They, his presence in the room is something that they consider to be a value. Um, and, uh, and that he's not an obvious upgrade on any team looking for goaltending creates this, this, this universe or this ecosystem where his trade value is going to be very depressed. Yeah. It's not, the conditions are not great for the Canes to get a lot for Jake Allen. Now, I agree with you that if you throw in taking a contract back, a problematic contract back, expiring contract though, um, and maybe you can add other elements and you can get other players in, involved and make it a bigger deal, then maybe yes. But because get, they got they got no use for an extra fourth round pick. So not really. It, well, other than using it as 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 trade capital. I mean that's, Yeah, but that's yeah. another thing that, that can't use that today. We already have twenty two picks for the next two drafts. Right. Uh, in an ideal world we'll try to move some of them and try to, you know, bolster our, our, our roster or get better. Uh, by using some of those picks. So, I mean, if you add a second-round pick, that's that's real currency. If you add a fourth-round pick, then it's a bit meh. At this time, might as well revisit the possibility of trading Allen in the summer when it, he becomes an, exp uh, 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 an expiring contract, when, you know, there's a reshuffling uh, of the goalie mm -hmm. market also. But I think that one, one thing that makes this whole thing difficult, too, is... Um, I saw that in uh, on on Twitter uh, over the weekend. It's uh, there, there was a chart uh, published by Jay Fresh about the uh, the the leaders, the the goalies, the leaders amongst um, goal saved above uh, ex goal saved above expected. So, which is a metric that's pretty interesting to to show you know how much your goalie and that's saved all, your team's That's in ass. all situations. It's not but, five on five. No, it's in all situations, but the top ten in the league. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through the list very quickly. Markstrom, Ingram, Demko, Ellebach, Allmark, Lindgren, Decord, Hill, Jari, and Montembeau. So half of those goalies were obtained by their current team for dimes for on nothing. the dollar. For yeah. nothing. An, ex, an expansion pick. A guy picked up on waivers. A, acquired for a fourth pick or a sixth pick or whatever. Mm -hmm. So... Everybody agrees that the goalie position is important, but if you are able to get such a high, high um, return or uh, you know a high level of effectiveness from goalies that seemingly come out of nowhere, it becomes very difficult after that to sell a proven record, a guy that's got a three point eight five million dollar contract that doesn't end this year. Mm -hmm. It's the market doesn't fit with the importance of the position it has never been no it, but it's, it's but, but it's but worse it's, than ever it's worse than ever because remember remember how we walked into this season everyone assumed that tampa bay was on the hunt that tampa yeah. needed a goalie to to quell the period between the start of the season and when andre vasilevsky was going to get back and it never happened they stuck with what they had they stuck with what the, yeah uh, but total, was it was it the right move though they're They're chasing for a playoff But spot. I don't, and, I don't think it was the goaltending that, that did them in early in the season. Like They just weren't playing very well. I mean, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't think well. it was really goaltending. Yeah, maybe a goaltender could have saved them a win or two. But at what cost? What's, what's, what's a win or two worth? Mm -hmm. You know? And so I think that was the calculation that Tampa made is that, yes, we could use an upgrade in goal to get us to our star goaltender being back. But what is the price to pay to get one or two more wins between now and then? They decided it was too high. Yeah, I think a lot of teams are going to decide it's too high. That 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 difference between our goaltending now and the goaltending that someone like Jake Allen would provide is not great enough for us to invest a lot in a trade for that player, unless there's that trade comes with someone else. You know, when you think of the Maple Leafs, let's say, if they're willing to add. At the deadline, um, someone like David Savard would look excellent in their lineup. Like the, he is exactly the type of person that they need in their lineup for playoff hockey. Um, they don't have that kind of that that yeah. snot element to their to their team, you know. And, Same with the Edmonton Oilers. I was watching them on Saturday, and gosh, yeah. is it David Savard would be good on that. So team. if you could package Savard and Allen, two guys yeah. whose contracts expire next season, um, and are, are at like a reasonable amount 
of money. It's not cheap, but it's not outrageous. If you can work something in with the two of them, now you're talking. Now you've created some value in a trade, and maybe you can get something interesting. Because I think the one guy that's, that could bring in pretty high draft pick between now and March 8th, and I don't know what the willingness is of the Canadians to explore this, would be David Smart. Yeah. Just because defensemen like him are coveted at this moment around the NHL. There are numerous teams, not just the Leafs and the Oilers, who are looking for that element to add on their defense. Uh, regarding the goalies, I thought that Hughes said something interesting when he said that Primo showed that he was ready for the challenge. Yeah. So it's uh, it's an interesting stamp of approval. And what do you say about – I actually missed that. Did you catch that when he said, uh, you know uh, – Based on conversations I had prior to the season, we yeah. knew he wouldn't get through waivers. He, was he more specific than that? He didn't. He name, said it in French, but yeah, he didn't name the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, we're not in a position to disclose uh, the, the 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 identity of those teams. But uh, he knew. He knew that uh, he would uh, Primo would uh, would not slip through waivers, mm-hmm. and uh, so that's fair. And I think that time has proven in. Right, because we finally see in Caden Primo uh, well, an NHL goal. And it's also because waivers, waivers seems to be the avenue of choice for NHL teams to acquire goaltenders. I mean, that's really, yeah. you know, when you like that list you mentioned earlier, a couple of those were waiver pickups. You know, so it's like it's it's there's a cost benefit analysis here, and it's it, it is the most important position in the in the sport. But I don't think it's. It's not the highest value position. It, it, it would be like, like Goal, somehow it's like health. It's when you don't have it that you know <laughs> you don't have it. But it's also like they are also the equivalent of a starting pitcher in baseball who they get paid and they they attract big value on the trade market. Starting quarterback in football, they get paid. They attract big value on the trade market. Um, basketball doesn't really have an equivalent, you know. But it, like they don't have an equivalent position. Um, But hockey is that, you know, it's the primary. You can't win without at least average goaltending. But, you you know, it used to be you had to have, like, next-level goaltending. Yeah. Now at least you need average goaltending, and and, which is why, as we mentioned in a previous episode, like, that's the value of Jake Allen. He's like, here, here is proven average NHL goaltending. Right. Well, I think that that's that's the use of Samuel Montembeau even more so as a guy that's If you're looking for good enough goaltending, well, he's he's not going to be a top tier goalie, but he suggests that he's going to be a good enough goaltender. Well, yeah, I'm well, not sure if Jake Allen will the still Canadians. be well, at this time of his at uh, this point in his career. And it's and and when you mentioned the thing about the fourth round pick not yeah. being all that important, um, I think it was at this time last year where Kent said that Jeff Gordon told him you can't go get more fifth round picks. Yeah. <laughs> Like, you're not allowed. That's, it's <laughs> over. Okay, stop acquiring fifth-round draft picks. So yeah. I think that's something also to keep in mind. And when he mentions, you know, you're, you're, they've reached a critical mass where they have enough draft picks. So I don't know. Well, it's, you know, based on everything that we – because basically if you look at the trade deadline six weeks from now and you have Sean Monaghan, you, you have Jake Allen, Let's not say a goalie anymore. You have Jake Allen. Um, there's no clear indication on David Savard's availability. Um, for, for a reason that I kind of have trouble understanding, uh, Mike Matheson shows up on, on trade lists. Yeah. I don't get the impression that they're willing to move him nope. unless something really, really significant comes their way. I think they're aware, they're aware that he's the, the defenseman that would attract the highest value. But they they would need to be blown out of the water to trade him at this point, and I exactly. think it's going to be the reality probably until the end of his contract. I'm not sure if he's you know if if they're not if by the time he finishes his contract the Canadians are not a playoff team. Sure, he'd be a great rental, and but they're not at that point yet because they need whether it's Savard or Matheson or both. They cannot let those young defensemen by themselves no. without having. They cannot. A couple of veterans at least. So yeah. those are the two guys. And Matheson and Savard have proven very uh, very valuable. I know your argument about the uh, the market being favorable for a defenseman like Savard. My my sense is that they're going to keep him and that he's going to be more uh, 
a trade candidate next year rather than than this season. Yeah, which would be which would be perfectly reasonable. Um, it's just that the rental the rental price you, you're running that risk, and you know Kent was asked today about about that. You know, do you want to do do you want to do what you did with Ben Sherat mm -hmm. or wait and risk Monahan getting hurt or Allen getting hurt? So in Savard's case, do you want to wait till next trade deadline and have his game suddenly crater? Yeah, and have him not be as effective as he's been this season, um, which I think is a significant. It's something that I think is worth thinking about. I think your point is very valid. You can't have, you can't just trot out six defensemen with three or fewer years of experience in the NHL. It's not, it's not viable. It's just not going to work. Um, you're not developing in that environment. You know, no. it's like it's not a development situation where, where you have six young defensemen. So Matheson, I think he's 32 and his contract expires. Something like that. He'll be he's he'll got, be still be a young defense. Like he'll still have another contract in him. Yeah. After that. And he's got the wheels to be able to to extend that level of efficiency a bit later than other guys. Yeah. So so that being said, so yeah. those are the those are kind of the, the names in play that we can kind of foresee unless something unforeseeable happens. Considering everything we've said, that they have reached a critical mass of draft picks, yeah. that the market is what it is, that it limits certain players. I mean, Monaghan's obviously a very attractive player at his, at his number. Um, you know, how, and based on everything Ken said today, what do you feel their level of activity will be based on all those conditions and circumstances that we just discussed? I think it'll be surprisingly underwhelming. <laughs> yeah, could yeah. Be. I I think that there's a there's a to take Hughes's words. Um, there's a lot of work still to be done, but I think it's going to be spread over a period of, a longer period of time. We can see that there's going to be like a a logjam on defense. That there's going to be defensemen that eventually are going to be trade bait just because they'll they'll have too many of them, but Is it urgent to fix that now? No, they're going to wait. There might be a guy leaving in the summer. There might be another guy leaving over the course of next season. Who knows? They might lose guys on waivers, and it might. won't be the end of the world. Yeah, but they'll – yeah. Like, I could see them losing Jonathan Kovacevic on waivers at some point. I think they're going to move him over the, in the, over the summer. That's my guess. Right, and when they're un unsuccessful in doing that, I think they'll, Why would they I think, I think they'll lose him on waivers. Oh, man, you, you, they'll – They've, they'll have no issue finding a taker for him. It's not he's he's better than Lindstrom. Lindstrom was okay. Well, Lindstrom was uh, was picked up on waivers because the Anaheim Ducks had just lost Pavel Minchikov to an injury. Did that not that not seem that whole thing putting putting Lindstrom on waivers right then? There's something fishy about that. It seemed like it was preordained that he was going to Anaheim. They just they lose Drysdale on the trade. Yeah, they lose Minchikov to injury. All of a sudden, Lindstrom's on waivers when he hadn't. He'd been out of the lineup for weeks at that point. At that very moment, the Canadians decided to put him on waivers, and they had right no, when it's clear that Anaheim needs a, a viable yeah. NHL defenseman. He, and he would have cleared if it had not been for Anaheim. But for what 48 hours, they went down to 22 guys, so there was no urgency. That was before yeah. that whole thing. HP is, came back. That yeah. was uh, our. I don't know. Anaheim, uh, Aneman was on a, an emergency call up. He was. But anyway, uh, they they had no they had no point at that time to to move him. Um, so, and, or, or at least to put him on waivers. Mm -hmm. uh, they did. He was picked up by Anaheim, and it's it's mainly because his right-handed shot. Kovacevic is a right-handed shot, but he's played a regular role in the NHL. He had his ups and downs, but I think that he's. Uh, He can be a regular NHL defenseman on the third pair, and I think that he's going to draw interest if they they look to move him uh, prior to the you know, the last year of his contract, very cheap contract. No, no issue there finding okay. a taker fan. Okay. So, but anyhow, the point being that this, this and Ken said it today. That there's no urgency to solving this situation on defense. Uh, he's aware that there's a logjam. He mentioned the possibility of using some of those younger defensemen as trade bait to go get a a forward 
um, kind of reading the room and seeing that there's there's this this angst over the lack of offensive talent on the roster and in the organization generally. Um, I, I'm, I'm my feeling is that the Canadians front office feels that that's overblown that they they have more talent than they're being cre- given credit for. I think the truth is probably somewhere in between um, that that they're maybe they're overvaluing some of the pieces that they have. You know, like they look at Newhook, Doc, Slavkovsky, Caulfield, and Suzuki as five members of a top six, and that being not so bad. You know, that that's a young group. They're going to get better. If you add that one sixth piece to it, um, that that's a pretty good top six in their eyes. Is that fair? Is that is that reasonable? I don't know. I think uh, I think the truth is somewhere between that and the angst. Yeah. <laughs> well, know? when you talked about Hughes being media savvy, he's 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 got his finger on the pulse when it comes to the market. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's well aware that we're all saying the same thing, all writing the same thing. Because of his mom, you think? Yeah, I think his mom's really on top of what people are saying. You think he needs his mom for that? <laughs> I think so. I think <laughs> well, it's cause yeah. of, partially because of his mom. Well, it's it's just that, yeah, we can all say that, that we can all see that this team lacks like high end talent up front, and it's it's understandably bothersome. I don't. I mean, when you do a rebuild. You want this team to – it's like the implicit um, – it's not even a promise, but it's certainly a hope that you're going to come out of that process being a contender for the for the cup, you know, at the end of that process. Mm-hmm. And since there's no high-end prospect up front that would could complement that top six, is the five guys that you named up front are enough to bring, even at their full maturity – all five guys hitting their ceiling, is that enough for them to become a cup contender? Probably not. Probably not. So that's, so that's I why the, I think that that hangs to a certain extent is justified. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's the ball's in their court now to solve that problem and see, okay, well, can, can we flip defensemen? Just uh, what's the expression that he used? He said, uh, we balance the ledger. We balance the ledger. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's, that, that's, will, That's what they will need to do. Yeah. But will they do it prior to the deadline? No. No. Will they do it prior to the draft? Probably not. Like that, That's the thing is that I don't think that they see – they don't see this team being really ready to compete before the yeah. season after next, maybe at the earliest. So really they have until next offseason, so the summer of 2025, to tackle this issue. Yeah, because even if you bring – that missing piece that they will need at some point. Yeah. The task for now and for, you know, for the foreseeable future mm-hmm. is maximizing the developments of the guys that you have now. Those yeah. five forwards, can you raise and, their level and, that and big make group of defensemen? That too, yeah. for sure. Identify you know who, are, thing, who are the ones that you're going to keep, who are the ones that you're going to move. Now, you had the last question of the, of the, of the press conference, and... You know, I think it's it's a pertinent question that that I I feel like Kent missed an opportunity to really give a strong answer to. You know, asking about how how most teams don't rebuild through the defense; yeah. they usually grab a, a forward core. And I think there's some exceptions, like Nashville. Um, We discussed uh, the, the Ducks, like the Ducks, from a yeah. previous a iteration, previous, a previous version of Lindholm them, yeah. and uh, Fowler. And so and it does happen. Theodore. It's not unprecedented, but it's not the usual way to go about it. And I don't think it's necessarily wrong. It's just that we're not used to seeing it. So if you have like a really elite group of one to six on defense, maybe that's even better than having an elite group one to six on forward. Who knows? But Kent, you gave Kent the opportunity to say something like that. Yeah. Um, And he punted on it. <laughs> he just he really, totally punted. And so we kind of said, you know, ah, we'll see. And we'll, maybe we'll balance the ledger and all this stuff. We'll use some of our surplus on defense to get some forwards. And I think he kind of punted on it because of his reading of the room and his understanding of that angst that, that yeah. he, he gets the sense that in the market, they're not necessarily, their people are not necessarily comfortable with a team built around a strong defense core the way they seem to be going. Um, pointing him pointing out that in 2022 our top three picks were forwards was another example of being kind of defensive about that. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, the year before 
The first pick was a defenseman. It wasn't by them, but still, the year before that, the first pick was a defenseman, Caden Gooley. So you had Gooley, Mayu, then Slaff, then, then Ryback. Yeah, yeah. So that's three out of four years. Your first round pick is on defense. And they doubled down on it by taking Ryback in. So own it. Like if you're going to do that, especially when there was interesting forward talent available aside from Mitchkov, even if you were totally anti Mitchkov, like Ryan Leonard was Leonard. sitting there. Yeah. as that sixth piece of the top six that could have filled that hole. You decide not to do that, and that's fine. And honestly, like I just spent a week reporting and learning about Ryan Backer, and I think he's a decent risk to take. I think he's, he's going to be a good defenseman for this team for probably a very long time. But if you're going to do that, then just own it. And be like, you know what? Yeah, we feel like our, our path to a cup is through the blue line, and, and we've seen – Cup winners of late have really big mobile defense cores, and we believe that that's the way to build a team. And yeah, you know, he just didn't. Uh, he didn't. He didn't take that opportunity. It was no, weird to me. No, he d- he yeah. did not. And it's it's also when you look at the way offense is created now in the NHL, with the how uh, defensemen are involved, it's 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 it could be a very good selling point to say, look, look at the way hockey is played now. Yeah, you need though that type of mobile defensemen you need guys that will jump into play that that you know the a rover like hudson uh guys that that you know that are sharp crisp passers that would that will like Reinbacher. or will judge their uh, or that have that balance of mobility and and toughness like mm-hmm. jack Eye, for example you there, there there are arguments in favor of that it's an it's unusual and but that's that's the the, the That's the card that they've, the cards that they have in their hand. Mm-hmm. They they cannot say all all of a sudden we'll build from up front. That's not what you got. What you got is a stack of young defensemen, a decent young offensive core mm-hmm. that needs to be upgraded. So, yeah, but what they have is also a stack of young defensemen who, based on their value in building teams. They will have valuable chips to move in order to augment, in order to balance the ledger. Like I didn't, I kind of like that expression that he's he's acknowledging that his ledger is currently unbalanced. There's there's yeah. an overflow of defense. There's a lack of forwards. Um, so they're going to address that. And so, but the thing is that there's no rush to do it. And I think it was Eric Engels who asked him directly. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are kind of wondering like, when are you going to move this glut of defensemen? What are you doing? And and Kent didn't give this the impression that there was a huge rush to do it. Um, the only thing that, that the only deadline that really applies here is, is waivers. And so, um, but I, I still don't think it's, it's imminently urgent to, to, to liquidate some of these defensemen into forwards. I was thinking a few days ago that it, I do that sometimes. I try. I was going to say, I was going to say, I, did, I decided not to say anything. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so it's, Of course, you want to, if you can wait, give yourself the maximum amount of, time, amount of time to assess your players so you don't make a mistake when you choose one versus another. Mm-hmm. And you say, okay, let's say Jordan Harris, how good can he become? Uh, it's, who exactly is he and who exactly is he going to become? Same for, I mean, Harris could be any other guy. There's no urgency there. But at the same time, Suzuki is... A, arriving in his mid-20s. Yeah. We perceive him as a young player. Uh, I don't. There, we, have, but, we have an all-season, basically. It's, this is his this I, is transition year to being like a, a veteran. veteran. A yeah. veteran, exactly. Yes. But even, you know, Caulfield, Newhook, Doc, guys from the same draft, the 2019 draft, it won't take long before they're not young players anymore. Already, that was five years ago. So was, the draft was five years ago. So there's I can't believe that. There's a yeah, I know. <laughs> that was a fun draft to cover. It was, huh? it was the last it was our last hurrah. That was the last pre COVID hurrah. Yeah. Yeah. Um so so there is as much as there's no urgency to evaluate those defensemen because you don't want to make a mistake, the clock will soon start ticking up front if you want to align, you know, those chips that you've got on the fence. Mm-hmm. And make sure that your 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 prospects on defense come and help a group of forward that before long a will need to get paid and b will 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 get older in age. So it's yeah, it, it's not it's not completely it's not dysfunctional, but they have to be remain aware that there's 
there's an alignment that needs to be maintained. So maybe I could best describe it kind of flipping sort of Amartyism where he talks about aggressive patients, like this sort of oxymoron. Well, I think that there's there's something to that notion with, with Kent of what you just described. Yes, there is there is something brewing that needs to be solved, but it's not happening tomorrow. It's not happening in the next six weeks. It's not necessarily going to happen between now and this draft. There is a little bit of time, but yeah. I agree that there's not an endless amount of time. So um, I think his, his answer kind of reflected that. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see. But it's, it's honestly, it was hard to, not only based on what Kent said today, um, just generally kind of looking at things. I mean, Sean, I think Sean Monaghan represents a good a good trade chip. Yes. You know, he is someone that I think teams will be willing to pay a considerable amount. I think you you, you kind of nailed it, the floor being the third round pick, but realistically a second round pick is is, is something that can be acquired or attained. Um, but there's, otherwise... There's also the fact that it's... It could be all, quiet. It could be quiet, yeah. Yeah, because I, I don't think Pearson's going to fetch them much. Pearson's uh, this year's Monaghan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I think Mon- Monahan also his value will be impacted by who are the other candidates. You know, if a team looks to get either a second line winger, a, th- a luxury third line center, or if they're really struggling at center, a second line center, those are the three slots where he could fit in. Uh, who are the other candidates that are available on the market, and how does Monaghan compete with those. And if he uh, if he does well to improve his value until March 8th, uh, then the Canadians could could get a better return if he positioned himself favorably. Well, I mean, I think that's what that comes market. back to what Kent was saying, where he was asked to evaluate sort of whether he's a buyer or a seller and, and who the buyers and sellers even are. He said it's too early, and he you know gave the example of last year, um, you know Calgary sort of flipping at the last minute and. and And other teams really take it to late February before they make that determination. Um, so that's going to be something worth monitoring. Like, where is Monaghan on the hierarchy? Like, he's the one known guy that's available up front. You know, there's there's a handful of others. You know, will Ottawa move Tarasenko? And so if, if some team is looking at Monaghan as a top six winger as opposed to a third-line center, does Tarasenko's availability in Ottawa suddenly move him down? You know, exactly. like, so like it's so Good and that's example. just an, it's an example. So so we'll see. You know, but I think he's like really the only guy that I, I, I would be surprised to see still on the team after March 8th. Okay, last topic before we wrap this up today. There won't be any Monday mailbag. We uh, we decided to focus only on, on Kent Hughes's uh, uh mid season press availability. Um Cole Caulfield. Hughes said that uh he was he didn't say that he was either disappointed or concerned with the lack of goals. Uh, and he put a lot of it on his shooting percentage that was unusually low, uh, both when compared to his you know previous track record. And also if you looked at the number of players that have a similar amount of goals compared to him, well, Caulfield's uh, save, uh, shooting percentage is much lower. What do you make of that? It's just facts. It's just, yeah, but, and, it's just, and, a, it's just it's, a it's, listing it's, of facts. I don't know. I don't make anything of it. Is it okay? Well, is it a cop out answer? Is it? Is it a? It's not a cop out answer. It's real. Yeah, it's a real answer. It's actually what's happening. And 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 he said, you know, is that bad luck or is there something else going on there that we need to look at? Like he didn't cop out. I don't think he gave a cop out to Cole Caulfield either. Like he's shooting, you know, less than half, less than half at the rate he was shooting last year. Mm-hmm. So that's real. Shooting percentage fluctuations are real. I think we discussed it recently. You know, there's the show. He's coming off shoulder surgery. That's a yeah. possible factor that Ken Hughes did not mention. Uh, but it is part of the context of what Cole's going through this season. And whether he likes it or not, it's just reality. Um, you can't ignore that. So, no, I don't think it's a cop-out answer. He's he's. It's It's not just him. Also, I mean, I think schematically on the power play, like, you know, that goal against Edmonton, like, We hadn't seen a goal like that all year. We saw them all the time last season. Like it yeah. was constant. So that that was a byproduct. They I think that they saw because they moved Suzuki was on the goal line for the yeah, past yeah. few weeks. They 
put him back in the right circle just because they knew that the, the that defensive be scheme Edmonton, that Edmonton I, gave that pass. But I think that that's something that they should consider sticking with because having Slaff there and having no one pass him the puck to shoot it and yeah. having, him, having him not shoot it on the few times he does get a pass in a shooting situation is just – you'd rather – just put Suzuki back there. He's been yeah. so effective there and puts Slaff in front of the net, and that's fine. Anyhow, it's getting away from the, the actual crux of it. Um, yeah, to me, him defending, not defending, just describing Cole's season as, you know, he said, he also said in that same thing, you know, you, we want our scorers to score. Yeah. So there's concern there, um, but it's not, I don't think, I think he, I think he described it accurately. It's not, it's it's not doom and gloom. No, no, no. Like they want their score to score goals, but this is what's going on. Why is it going on? We need to get to the bottom of it. Is Cole responsible for it, or have we done something? Is there something? Is there something we we can find a solution? But it's just a fact that it's very unusual to see a goal scorer a goal scorer's shooting percentage drop by fifty percent year over year. Yeah, the there's still proof. That, we still need to know, though, if Cole Caulfield is a 16% guy, you know? You yeah, know yeah there's not so, enough of a track record. I no. understand that. But I can I fairly confidently say he's not a 7% guy. Nope. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> right now he's at 7. I think we can all agree that he's not going to finish at 7. No. All right. Well, thanks uh, for listening to this uh, edition of the Best Who and Good Night Notebook. Uh, we'll be back on Friday. Uh, with our usual segments and uh, we'll enjoy the games until then the Canadians have a busy schedule in front of them uh, tonight they're playing the Colorado Avalanche with uh, Avalanche. Avalanche yeah I pronounced it in French way just because I had Jonathan Drouin in my head already I was ready I was just setting it up uh, but Joe is uh, Joe's doing really well in Colorado yeah good for lately. him happy for him yeah so he's he's been buzzing next to his buddy Uh, McKinnon. So uh, I'm curious to see if he's going to continue that tonight in Montreal. And what's going to be the reaction also, uh, both from the crowd, but also from Joe himself? Is he going to be bolstered by uh, the motivation of playing in Montreal, or is it going to make him more quiet? I don't know. I think it's going to be an interesting storyline tonight. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, talk to you soon.